Yep, indicators of compromise may be compromising your Android analysis. All right, who am I? I work for the National White Collar Crime Center, and I'm from the lovely state of West Virginia. My professional job right now is uh, hacking into, analyzing, breaking, analyzing some more, all the fun mobile devices and uh, those things, those things that are the buzzword that I'm going to refute to say. So surprising surprise, I'm from Charleston, West Virginia. So when I hopped online and I says, hey, I want to go and talk at Charleston B-Sides, it's a little bit farther away than just going around town. It's about eight and a half hours. Wrong Charleston. Wrong Charleston. It's a great Charleston. This Charleston is so much more pretty. All right, so what this talk is going to be, in my tenure, um, I've, had, I've had a lot of interesting cases, and I've worn a lot of different hats. Um, I've been part of a prosecution team, and I've put people in prison for the analysis of what's on their mobile device, whether it's contraband on the device or we're using it as intelligence. I've assisted state, local, and federal agencies in their intelligence gathering efforts on mobile devices, and I've even done civil litigation with it. And now in my job, there's a lot more research and a lot more of that subject matter expert consulting. And with that, one of the big things that I see is it is a full ecosystem on a mobile phone, much like with a computer. And if you do any type of incident response or forensics work, one of the big things that we're always doing is taking steps to validate our evidence, taking steps to verify our evidence. And it's not just those safe evidence handling procedures or, you know, if I'm going to do IR, yeah, we're going to stomp on that box a little bit in the IR process, but we're going to be taking the steps and getting the information we need to provide authenticity to our artifacts. So one of the big things that we don't see with mobile devices, um, and that's why I want to share this with y'all, is when we look at a mobile device and the commercial solutions out there when it comes to acquisition and analysis, or even the bespoke solutions or the custom scripted solutions, there's a lot to be desired. Um, you know, if we have a Windows box, throw the dart at the board and you're going to find a more than capable product. Some are better than others. Um, you know, jump out and looking for a professional consulting team. Again, some are better than others, but the availability, the transparency, and the knowledge is way out there. But with mobile, it's an emerging landscape. And it gives a lot of different vectors. And as if I am a computer user and I'm not elected to turn on Skype and I am just utilizing my Windows box to grab email and to do other corporate functions, my attack surface is relatively small. I'm most likely going to be on that network as part of my business. If I get a work from home, take it to a coffee, sh coffee shop, there's is is risks there. But with mobile, it's a completely different rodeo. Um, one of the big things when it comes to verifying that evidence, if we find something, is a mobile device is one of those things where I can put photographs on your device. You know, in my tenure as a law enforcement officer, I've had tons and tons of people tell me that the thousands of evil images on their computers just got there. And doing computer forensics, we know that that's not the case. With a mobile device, the lines are getting more blurred. Um, just by knowing your number, I'm able to send you a thousand images. And yes, you could block me, but I'm going to get a different number. and You're probably not going to change yours, so I'm going to still continue to do that. Not only can I send those images, I can socially engineer you. And it's in a more digestible way. Um, folks are getting better and better when they're in that corporate environment, and we know it's work email. And we're having our work email give us a banner that says, do not click on links. This is an external email. It shows up flagged. There's a lot of rules going into place, but you're getting your text messages just free. And the tiny graph that you can't see as part of there um, is a trending graph of the development of new malware samples for the Android platforms. So that's not just the total samples about. That's the total samples, the average being brought. So for 2017, 4.4 million, and for 2018, 2.7 million. So those, yep, yeah, arbitrary numbers that I'm saying in a talk, but it's a huge attack surface. Tons of new samples. In the trend, it did go down 17 to 18, but it is still much higher than it's been. And the big thing is, yes, there are constant attacks. And one of the reasons that Android becomes such a huge target is it's got a three-quarter market share globally. More users use Android. Um, it's in more devices. It's, the kernel is open. It's the Android open source project. It's much more inspectable. And while that lends itself to increasing its security because we have vendors that are responsible for pushing out our patches and our update cycles, we start to get behind the ball. 
So much on iOS, we make that trade of telemetry versus security. From a security standpoint and an IR standpoint, there's very limited telemetry in iOS. It's hard to inspect things. It's hard to acquire the data and then analyze it. With Android, we can, but we're also behind that ball in a different security model. And it's not just like we had talked earlier about potential key loggers or potential spyware. There's actual in the wild observed samples that we're pulling off of Android devices that are capable of reading your text messages, capable of reading your call logs, capable of fabricating entries into your text messages, um, performing malicious redirects on your web browsers, um, harvesting your location data, harvesting audio files. And there are even a few unique samples that go to that ability of remote interaction to where they're actually able to, in real time, grab data, enact things, uh, take pictures. So that brings us to what can we actually do to start combating it? So one of the big things in any type of incident response case is going to be indicators of compromise. So if there is some type of security incident or potential security incident that has alerted us to something, and we are trying to do our root cause analysis or dig in so we can, one, contain it and then work to eradicate and remediate, IOC are great because they're going to be signatures. Um, they're going to be hash values of files, executables, payloads. So there's going to be unique signatures that we can look for, um, locations of certain artifacts. Um, certain IOCs are written that, hey, if this path is created, that's a potential indicator of compromise. There's no benign Windows processes or there's no legitimate third-party applications that are creating these pathways with these naming conventions. Um, we see a lot of not and or else logic, um, which is, is it named this and not this? And it also contains this. Um, file paths, different characteristics, and just anomalous characteristics of it. So it's a huge. IOCs allow us to inspect um, a device a lot of different ways, but there's a problem whenever it comes to getting to do that. So if I am an Android user or an enterprise that has Androids as part of my work product, Google and the Android Open Source Project gives us a couple things. We get Play Protect. Um, we can use different enterprise mobility management or mobile device management solutions. We're able to go in and make sure people have passcodes on. We can go in and limit the Wi-Fi's that they can grab. But a lot of other types of security we're leaving up to that device to handle we wouldn't go and deploy a Windows computer and just leave it up to the native Windows applications for security. There's always going to be an enhancement, or generally there's going to be an enhancement. But we do that with mobile. And we end up seeing quite a few failures. The Play Protect store is riddled with errors. Um, there has long been the statement, hey, if, as long as I download this application from the Google Play store, then I'm good. Any given day when we go and we do a scrape, it's a quarter million to 300,000 samples that are active in the Google US Play Store. Now this has been trending down, but it's still pretty big. If you're an Android user, what's one of the big reasons that people always say we use Android? We want more customized, we want to be able to customize it more. We want to be able to change our operating system. We want to be able to watch movies before they're released. And we're doing that at a cost of our security and our privacy. Um, anytime we go outside of the Google Play Store, we're to going to an even bigger risk. Risk, And in modern versions of Android, built on the NSA kernel, you know, it's a very hardened operating system. There is a lot of constraints that are going in. Um, communications, interprocess communication is being handled through various API to keep it secure, but there's still vulnerabilities. So one of the big things that we see happen is, I'm an enterprise, I have mobile devices, we use enterprise mobility management, which doesn't do much in terms of security. It's our common security. But then things happen. Where I'm a device owner, or I'm an investigator, I work for a consulting firm. We've got a mobile device incident response. Do you work for an organization and somebody is subject to an internal investigation? One of the first things we're going to do is go and seize or attempt to seize either the corporate asset mobile device, or we're going to see if we can seek legal process and get their personally owned mobile device. Um, criminal cases, civil litigation, tons of things are involving mobile devices. So where's the big problem with it? All right, first off, security is compromised incident response. If we're going to make the statement and we're trying to scope out an incident for containment and remediation, 
we've got to be sure of what we're doing. It's one thing to think of it narrow scope with, I have one mobile phone and I have one computer. But when we think of today's organizations, we're talking millions of endpoints. And when we're trying to correlate how this attack or how this data has been lost, and we've got to look at that full scope, we can't just say, yeah, it looks like it came from this mobile device. We have to be able to say that with certainty. Root cause analysis, one of the big things that we see a push for in today's media and in today's government operations is that attribution characteristic. You're going to say, hey, there was this that occurred, and we want to say that this certain group did it. Or in my case, I've acquired data and I've analyzed it, and I may be attempting to take somebody's freedom away for the rest of their life based on what I found on their device. And that's something that I don't take very lightly. Um, it could be somebody could end up losing their job because of it if it's an internal investigation. So the big thing comes, if we are looking at that mobile device and we're saying, okay, I'm going to pull these text messages off there. I'm going to pull these call logs off there. But with just that little note that millions of active, actively developed Android malware samples, the attack surface is huge. It's phone calls. You know, somebody could call you and say to go to this website. Email. Email's being pushed to our phone. Um, Users are more apt to click things on their phone because we trust everything on our phone. We get SMS messages. We have Facebook on there. Um, we have other social media platforms that are all avenues for social engineering or you know, phishing campaigns, clickbait, being sent somewhere you don't want to go. So that's where we get the wolf in sheep's clothing. So when it comes to true evidence integrity, are you sure that you can attest to how these things got on that device just by acquiring data and looking at it? Really sure? There's money on the line, there's jobs on the line, and in a lot of cases I've worked, there's people's freedom on the line. So when we look at those common acquisition methods, we have things like ADB, talking Android Neuroscope. We've got some commercial tools up there, Oxygen Forensics and Celebrite, Magnet Forensics, and these are just different companies that make a product to speed up and enhance the analysis and acquisition of these mobile devices. A lot of mobile device management and EMM solutions also will allow some data acquisition or some remote cloud pool or some remote backup pools with ADB. And ADB is the Android debugging bridge. It's a native client that's part of the Android operating system that allows some low level communication. It's really cool. And then of course some of my favorite types of acquisitions are when I get to rip phones apart and remove the chip. Chip off acquisitions, in systems programming acquisitions, different ways to get the data. So we get the data. What do we do with it? 99% of the examiners that I get to teach and help and work with, they grab the data and they pop it in a tool, they hit the magic find evidence button and we move on to the next thing. It has, I'm telling you, mobile forensics has changed so much in the last few years, but it's become the Nintendo forensics world. There, are, there is a tool that literally has a find evidence button and you hit it and the blue wheels start turning and you just sit back and wait. And your presentation of your evidence is categorized by what they want to tell you it is. And one of the things that we don't see in the, one of these being the most popular and robust mobile forensics tool in the world, when you hit that go button, it's not assessing anything about that device's security. It's not taking any steps like it's doing to parse many arbitrary applications and present you with data. There's nothing going on to say, yeah, this is... Given the context of a human using this, there's nothing going on. In one of those tools, you're able to click on a malware scanning button, um, and it's one of the few tools that lets you do it, and it does a signature-based search with Bitdefender. So a pretty robust hash set. Sometimes there's going to be some static names, um, depending on where the database is, but I've seen hits before with getting some static names. But what do we know about malware when we see it? Is it always going to be the same name? Is it going to be downloaded as one thing, and is it going to stay that? One of my favorite examples, an oldie but goodie, is Zeus. What happens when you run Zeus? It disappears. The process is given some arbitrary character value. Um, so if we're using that methodology and looking at the device statically, we're not going to find any indicator of a compromise, even though it could be riddled with, it. Riddled with evidence with it, and that, and that compromise could affect the integrity of what we're doing Nothing's going on. So I wanted to find something because one of the big components of my current job is to actually go out and teach state, local, and tribal law enforcement. And I wanted to be able to give 
the folks who are working these cases something that isn't barbarically difficult. Because whenever I think of it, I get excited. I'm like, we're going to go to the command line, we're going to use clam AV, we're going to use low key, and we're going to do it like this. And we're going to be great people just typing on that blue and black screen. That's not the way the world operates. So we've got to add a little bit of integration in there. So Brian Carrier's tool, Autopsy, and Autopsy 4.9 has a really great open source module that lets you grab an API key from VirusTotal. So community API key from VirusTotal is free. Uh, Autopsy is free, so we love them both, and they can handle ext4, ext-x, and the FAT32 file systems. All the file systems we're going to find on Android, and it does a lot of analysis on there. So one of the things VirusTotal will do is it will go through and it's going to look and say, hey, um, this is known to me, this is not known to me. Um, but again, it's only looking based on what that module is telling it to submit. There's going to be some limitations on that public API. But of course, it's nothing, it's not the, fuel, the full Yara rule. It's not a full contextual analysis of the evidence. It's going to be based also on that hash. It's going to be based on name. It's going to be based on, um, depending on the way you have the ingest module configured, are we going to do any searching for URLs? Are we going to try and put URLs up to VirusTotal to be searched? But it's a, good, it's a good time. So when I got there, I realized as I was making this, when I, when I make these PowerPoints, I try to roll through an investigative process. And I kind of skipped a couple things, which is why just signatures wouldn't be that great. So when we look at a model for malware detection published by Mavia, we can see that we have signature-based, anomaly-based, specification-based. And that's at a very high level. And if we look at something just based on Signature based, static, that's where we would have a hash. We're taking a hash of the entire executable, in this case an APK for the Android device, a subcomponent of that APK, because APKs are archives that can be um, unarchived and you can see their core files. Is it the way that something creates a signature, whether it be a process ID or a process name dynamically? Um, is it a combination thereof? And that's where we see that these current methods, as discussed in the previous slide, we're not able to look at that because the data set is static. So we've got to really work that limited data set that we have. So the biggest thing was, I knew I couldn't reinvent, reinvent the wheel on it because I wouldn't need to. So the best thing was to do was to find a method to intelligently search for indicators of compromise on that evidence set with its unique characteristics. So I knew that Yara, yet another ridiculous acronym, um, which is the Swiss, what, what do they call it? The Pattern Matching Swiss Army Knife for Malware. Yara rules are really cool. It's a very plain, um, easy to follow scripted lang uh, text language that will just give conditions to an artifact or to an object. So where I can say, does it contain a certain ASCII string at this offset? Um, does it contain this hash at this location? There's a huge culmination of different things that Yara can do. Honestly, it can do pretty much anything you want. So when we're looking at the mobile ecosystem and we know that, okay, we're going to have APKs, our apps. Those apps are going to have databases containing data. We know that we can download it from the Google Play Store, but what happens every few weeks when we've downloaded an app? What, what comes through? An update. Are those updates managed directly through the Google Play Store or are those arbitrary? Many are arbitrary. So what we have is, yes, the initial application passed the Google Play Store. A week goes by, we update it. We now have malware. One of the biggest ones that we saw was Pokemon Go. Um, Pokemon Go was, was one of the huge things that we saw that people were figuring out and saying, hey, people are downloading this. Is there a way that we can take over some of this control when we do the update? Is there a way that we can push people out of the application store into a Trojan horse that they download freely off the internet? So that's where Yara came in, because we are able to get down at a much more granular level, determine different things we wanted to classify with it, and even use it to look for known blacklisted phone numbers. So who in here, if you use an Android, if you use something like Truecaller? So Truecaller is an app that will come through and it will say, hey, this is a potential spam call. I use it and it's pretty successful. Truecaller is pretty cool. You can get an API key from them. They've got a full software development kit. And I'm currently working on a project to where that's going to be incorporated. So whenever we analyze these Android devices, we're not only doing Yara for known malware, 
or known indicators of compromise. We're also looking for, do we have Texas text messages and phone calls from blacklisted numbers? Because that's the full context of the threat environment for Android. So the big ones that I came up with working the best was first was Clam Antivirus, um, part of get to it from Talos, the Talos Research Group's website. Um, Cross-platform, very extensible malware scanning engine. Um, it can do amazing stuff with email gateways, but it does really good at pointing it at the acquisition set of data from Android and letting it roll. Um, a very robust signature set. You can write your own clam rolls if you want to extend its capability for known samples. Fast, free, we love it. The other one was using Loki. Loki is a very um, Spartan um, IOC scanner. It is extraordinarily flexible and it will take in hashes, it will take in rule sets, and it will take in Yara rules. And you can point it at anything you want. So in my case of an Android backup, whether it's an arbitrarily mounted volume on a Linux system or whether it's a bundle of files on a Windows system, I can point Loki at it and have amazing results. So everything's working great. So my framework that I would do, um, IR cases, mobile forensics cases, I'm going to grab the data in whatever manner I want to. Um, most often ADB and over a variety of the different ADB implementations. Um, Android, we can do what's called a custom recovery, where we would do an, boot it to an alternate operating system or install a completely different operating system. Um, is the device something that we can root and we can get a root shell on and we can use DD and pull data back out listening on Netcat? Or does it require some physical intervention like JTAG, Joint Test Action Group, soldering on to those PCB pins in systems programming where we're actually going to sidestep in on the actual NAND memory package? Or chip off. It's everybody's favorite. We physically sever the chip from the mobile phone and we pop it in a reader or pop it in an adapter and we do our analysis that way. We can either mount it as, if we do chip off or a lot of these, we're going to have the, ex, the entire physical extent of that memory on the device. Um, and you see some really crazy stuff. You see most Android devices are 20 and 30 partitions. Um, the Motorola HTC M, M19 was like 99 partitions from the factory. Um, so you find a lot of different unique, new, unique environments that Android is operating in. So we grab the data, we pull it down. All right, so then we fire it up with Loki. And Loki in that, it's a very small screenshot. But it, from the factory, they're already helping you out with false positive hashes, file name locations, file names that are suspicious, hashes, um, some Yara rules for hack tools, web shells, just general Yara rules. So there are tons of things that from the factory it's ready to look at. You can go and simply Google search, I need Yara rules for this specific thing on GitHub and help pull it down. So Loki performed valiantly. Clam AV worked flawlessly. I did not. I was missing the mark. And one of the big things was I've got a brand new, in this case I was using, beta version of Android Pie. I never stopped to actually look at the rule sets that is being shipped in these tools. So I had to stop and I had to look. And turns out Android 9 rule sets, whether it be in a commercial antivirus product that's for Windows or Mac OS, or in the case, the rule set for some of these uh, for Loki isn't really cognizant of these Android malware sets. So yes, they're performing their job, and we're not going to find anything because we're looking for Windows executables or Windows IOCs on Android. We're not going to get anything. Um, now, there are some. And trust me, I Googled it a lot because I really didn't want to have to do what I was decided to do next. So I Googled a lot. And I compiled a lot of stuff, um, way too much stuff, honestly. Quick question. Yes. So even in the regards of like file system indicators and things like that, if you're dealing every different device that you're investigating with different partitions and paths and things mm -hmm. like that, those are going to impact the accuracy yes. of those indicators as well. Yeah. So I mean, even just simple things like that, you would essentially have to extend to almost build of, specific. Yeah, you'd have yeah. to almost replace the indicator list specific to that device yeah. or, you know, make, model, whatever, you know, that, distinguishes it. Yes, and one of the big things that, so like with Android, so we'll have Android 7. So then I might have a Samsung Galaxy S7. I'll say Android 7.0.1, security update R32. 
what version of Android 7.0.1 is it? Is it API 22, API 23, API 24? So then there's a whole other set of conditions that Google has in it. And you're exactly right. So if I write a Yara rule and it wants to look for um, a WiMAX partition, that's one vendor that has that partition. So exactly right. So if it's going to, I can either spin my wheels doing that or have I not written that rule set and then that's specific. Present, like actual devices, drivers. Yep. And it's huge. And one of the crazy things that I was that I found was of all the GitHub repos I was searching through to find people that had already written some Yara rules concerning it, the average time was three years old. And we know that the landscape of anything malicious, that's we still have to do the due diligence and make sure that the old stuff's not there. Um, because how often do we see that folks are talking about old vulnerabilities? Or an antiquated set of I, an antiquated IOC scan would actually be able to find something of, of fruit. But in the newest one I found was nine months old. So I, you get reintroduced. Uh, yes. Bills will reintroduce. Uh, yeah, and I did notice that it's kind of like whenever we see the kits, like when Rig was really popular. Really yeah, you're gonna see the the clustering, where we see the clustering techniques. And that's one of the cool things about Yara is where it can be so extensible, is where we can open source our Yara rules and people can come in and say, hey, can I write in that line? I have an HTC. Can I write in language into your open Yara rule? Um, so that's what I decided to do. I'm very fortunate that where I work and the manner in which I get to work is I currently have probably 400 Android test devices of a variety of operating systems, builds, my my office looks ridiculous at any given moment. I mean, it's it's a sight to behold. None of them are really great. <laughs> now, some of them are decent phones. But I've decided to go on a hunt. So luckily, FireEye makes a lot of tools so that folks who aren't that great at it like me can have a chance with IOC Writer and IOC Editor. Um, and I've literally went out and have pulled every Android malware sample that I can find off GitHub, every Android malware sample I can find off VirusShare, Virus Bay, Hybrid Analysis, all the ones who will let me download it. And that brings me to my, the project that I'm working on with it. So our workflow, acquire. Hit it with Clam AV. Hit it with Loki. Look for the indicators of compromise. But know that we have to embolden that. So surprisingly, this really short domain was still open. Like, I, I can't believe I left out with that. Android, IOC.org, it'll return nothing, or that spam site will try and sell it to you. Um, righteously bought for $12, though. Running project of Android malware samples, smishing campaigns, claim rules, Yara, Yara rules, and in the spirit of happy, uh, in the spirit of Billy Madison, O'Doyle rules. So that's where I'm standing with the IOCs because you will find them. Android is riddled. One of the things I did notice was using one of the commercial tools that had integrated with Bitdefender. If you get a device with some road miles on it, like a year on it that's got true use, it's going to flag signatures. And every time that I did that, I'm like, if it's flagging signatures, I can't only imagine what else I'm going to find when I dig down and actually do a more in-depth analysis. So I've talked about finding the malware. But one of the big things that's woefully missing in a lot of mobile forensics training, I think only one really big national provider, a certain institute, really hammers it in with their mobile forensics training, is what do we do? What, how, if I'm going to be presenting a statement uh, or summary of these artifacts and they need to hold weight, whether it be in court, arbitration, um, executive committee, or just as part of an investigation. What have I done? And a lot of times when we find this, I know I've consulted with a lot of examiners and whenever I encourage them to go and look for it, and they're like, Chris, I found it, what do we do? All right, this is where we start. We've got to figure out what it is capable of. So we need to analyze it find out what his permissions are, find out what that actual core executable is. Can we do a sandbox detonation? And that's usually where we go. So for the crash course part of this, we've defined our security. We're going scanning. If you go hunting, you're going to find prey eventually. So if we go hunting for malware, we're going to find it. Or if we go hunting for other indicators of compromise, you do it enough, you are going to find it. Now what do you do? Of course, the 101's isolation, cautious precautions, this is not, your forensic machine shouldn't be on the wide web for most traditional forensics, especially mobile. Um, 
but we have to have an appropriate analysis platform. So for doing this project, pretty much I did everything with Microsoft Windows, and I let the FireEye Flare team do a lot of the heavy lifting for me with their virtual machine build of Flare virtual machine. And then there's a really great open source project called Android Tamer, uh, an X distribution that's already set up with all of the, the hundreds of packages that really allow you to dive deep into an Android file system. Because the Android files, the Android executable in the Android file system is a little more than just that APK. That APK as it sits on your device or what you download from the Google Play Store is actually a little more. It's going to be an archive. So if you are on a Nix-based machine or Mac, you're going to be able to un unarchive it and go jumping in. So usually I give folks two sets of device. When I've gotten that data, of course, I'm going to make a, a static copy that we keep for purposes of archival. We're going to have two or three copies of it that we've made for our analysis. Depending on the environment in the case, we can use tools like VirusTotal, Hybrid Analysis, Anubis, Joe's Sandbox. The list goes on of online sandboxes that will do automated, automatic detonation and work on generating that automated report. But much as I was able to go to Hybrid Analysis and download samples, so can you. So if you're doing anything that may have PHI, personal, personally identifiable health information, or PII, personally identifiable information, or something that is you just don't want the world to know. Um, and if you also have like a virus total account, a virus total intelligence account, I can have I can define certain things that I will be alerted to. So there is of course always that thought that somebody malicious will be watching to see when their maliciousness is alerted to. Um, so always take that into consideration before we file everything up. So once we open the, that's a really great handwritten, what's in your Android APK, your Android manifest, um, assets, libraries, classes. So it's going to be your Java byte code that's actually going to run that sucker. So what are the big things that I look for immediately? So in static analysis, I'm a big fan of dumping that over with strings or, again, using FireEye makes a great tool called Floss that looks for strings with different parameters and through some obfuscation. And I'm going to look for the basic things because I still find the basic things from malware in the wild. I, can, I routinely still grab Android malware from the wild, and I find hard-coded URLs from the strings function. You feel amazing when you do that. Like, this is so easy. Um, you find very verbosely declared permissions right in it, in the manifest that says, hey, I want to have the permission to read SMS. I want to have the permission to receive SMS, read the user dictionary, read contacts, access, access the location, and so on. Now, if you are, are an Android user, what do we know happened a couple versions ago when I download an application? I am warned immediately. This application wants to read my SMS, this application wants to do all of this. People agree to it. That's, that's still the crazy thing. Um, folks agree hand over fist. The desire and that drive for that to just, they want that app and they want it to work now. They'll agree to anything. But that's always great whenever I can find, okay, I've read these permissions, but then I've observed its analysis in a sandbox and it's requesting elevated permissions or it's, request, or it's received permissions greater. So that's where we know there may be something awry. So again, we can jump in there with tools like J, you know, Java Detox uh, for Mac, o, Mac OS and Windows, JD GUI, Dextajar. There's a lot of different things that we can do to help break it down to get that readable JavaScript. Um, has it been obfuscated? There's tons of ways we can de-obfuscate it. One of my favorite is CyberChef. Um, can run pretty much any function you want over something. So that way I'm able to look at the functions. I can look at the code signatures. I can look at the declared permissions and see what I've got going on. Knowing that I'm going to be able to probably pivot into something like a sandbox report. This is a screenshot from a Joe's, Joe's Pro Android sandbox. And they hit it on the mark. They start out with huge graphics to come in and say, hey, this malware is doing all of these things. It has things in place for spam. It has things in place to affect the networking. And when you go and you drill down, because this is the high level what to do when I find it, you're going to be able to, from a high level, say this malware was potentially, based on this analysis and what we have, was not capable of affecting this article of evidence that has pent them out to our investigation. Or conversely, um, 
because of things like in the criminal system, Brady, we've got to be able to say incriminate, incriminating evidence and exculpatory evidence. Um, due diligence, have we actually looked for all of the articles of evidence and have we given an explanation to them? So that's one of the big things that we run into with that. All right. And this talk went way too quick. I went, I flew through it with, with uh, you four folks in here. All right. So, is anybody? Yes, hit me. So, during your forensic gathering, you said sometimes you'll physically manipulate the phone. How is yes. chain of custody preserved with that in legal cases? All right, so the way that chain of custody, so I'll walk through a sample one, and this one has actually went to court and been adjudicated. So, we arrive on scene, I'm executing a search warrant, I take the evidence into my possession. At that point, I make notes of the state it's in. You know, is it on? Is it off? If it's on, I'm going to take steps to isolate it from radio connectivity. So pop the SIM card, airplane mode, put it in a Faraday bag. It's going to control the state. So at that point, but you're physically manipulating the device then. How is, how, as a prosecutor, are you defending against defense saying that you manipulated right. that device? Well, so that's where, we, that's where we keep falling through. So the big thing that I've learned is transparency with it. So when I show up on scene and I'm going to snag that phone, there's going to be a picture of it before I've touched it. And my notes are going to be verbose. And I always would, I, I called them pig pads, the little like shirt, shirt pocket size notebooks mm -hmm. that would have my verbose notes. Those go ahead and get copied over and sent with the discovery. One of the big things I found is there's a lot of folks that try to withhold things or they want to make people work for it. I was just an open book. It's like, here's everything you want. So yes, I would state in my, in my executive summary, I touched the device. I've used an Android device for nine years. I put it in airplane mode. If you want to know what airplane mode is, we can go and look at the open source developer's guide or we can go and look at Jonathan Levin's Android Confectioner's Cookbook and be able to definitively say what went on there. So then it keeps going. Because you said the physically manipulation. Oh yeah, this is where it gets dicey. Okay, even picking it up, it, it's, there's, I was going to say, aren't there some, one of the things that I've seen kind of transpire is, you know, obviously prosecutors are going to try to argue these things, but they ultimately like have been proven through like statutes or policy or just mm -hmm. observed case law that to be ineffective at arguments in many cases where they get thrown out, but that gives you some leeway in regards to like certain things that the state of what that action does is documented. Yeah. And so essentially like it's about defending evidence at that point. Like there's a lot of case law I know that um, like essentially like by a prosecutor picking up a gun and removing the bullets that that is yes. a safety thing, so like for this, that does not is not considered a method of destroying evidence, or that that does not alter the state. So, yeah. and I don't say that to because it's not obvious necessarily. I agree with you, but isn't that part of it? Yes, like, because and Indian solutions they'll erase yes. the phone if you don't put it in the bag or you don't have it right. Available. And when the big thing is a search warrant is meant to be a static artifact of time. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to get something real and ongoing, that's going to be a Title Three, you know, pin trace. That, that's an intercept. Like, if I wanted to listen to a live phone call, that is a whole other ball game than simply going before a, you know, judicial officer in my state with an app sworn affidavit requesting on these merits permission to take something. And upon the time that I take it, it can't change. It's, and if it changes, I'm responsible for it, and I have to explain why. So where that gets tough is a lot of these devices we get are locked. A lot of these devices, they will not give us the passcode. And there's still a lot of debate on whether people can be compelled in the United States to give a passcode. So we are left with breaking it. And this is one of those keywords, it depends. Um, you know, some devices, for a long run of Android devices, USB OTG. I've got a USB rubber ducky that I had tons of ducky scripts. I'd pop it in, brute force it, unlock device. Other ones, um, you know, now there's a really big exploit set called emergency download mode where we're causing a short in a Qualcomm processor that exposes it in different ways as a, uh, as a different process to a Windows box. Um, different versions of the Team Win Recovery Project, different versions of the Odin Project. Um, yeah, because you were talking about things like rooting the device. Yeah. You know, at that point, you're substantially changing You are substantially changing it. So the way that I've always accomplished this, especially if it's going to be evidence that is going to be going to potentially a criminal trial. Yeah, that's the simple stuff I don't care about. Yeah. I'm more concerned about. Yeah, so for a criminal trial, so if I have a device, well, one, if I'm rooting it, I know I have access to it. So the reason I would root is to enhance the level of access. 
So a lot of Android devices, like you've got an S7. If you take that S7 and you fire up an ADB shell, you're not going to be able to go in at that level of permission most often and get your text messages, the MMS, SMS MMS database. It's too high of a permission for ADB. We can root it and we can go and get it. We can root it and we can use DD and get the full extent of that Android file system. Get the full extent of the databases, the actual applications installed, all of these great paths. And we can see not only the paths, but the way their context relates with other paths. So we can really verify that evidence. So yeah, we're, <laughs> I mean, we're, we're hacking the device. I mean, we're grabbing root shell on it. Before that is done, we've acquired data and tested methods to the highest extent we can. So it, you're never going to jump in and say, I'm going to root before I've even seen what I can get. And you're documenting along the way. And then for me, I'm not going to do it if I've never done it before. So I can tell you that the employers that I've done this for um, and the agencies that I've done it for have all been really good. And we'd usually drum up a test device to say, okay, we are going to be, our platform is a Samsung Galaxy S7 930V from Verizon. This is what we want to do. We're going to take that, seed it with known data, perform the action, and then go after it and look for the modifications. So that way we can go and say, you know, we did it as controlled as we could, utilizing these methods. A lot of times these exploit methods are open source. So we're able to say these, this is the actual methodology behind it. Um, you know, where it gets goofy is in iOS right now, there are some things that are not to be talked about, capable of doing some things. And the same goes with Android. Um, you know, that physical exploitation is, is a huge thing. And there are certain commercial tools that are very robust, support the passcode of thousands of devices. And you're not really told how it's doing it. And I've been in the position where I'm taking that to court. And your narrative is, I had this device. These are the steps I've taken. Here's my initial evidence. I then performed this action. Here's the evidence. But what if it's locked? We never had evidence. That's a good question. Because, yeah. How would you feel? Because you do, you've done offensive work before in the, or do offensive work. How, how would that go if I said, okay, the only way I was able to get this data off these 10 computers was offensively jumping in, grabbing a, a shell, and pulling it out. Well, that's, that's my job. Yeah. Right? Like, that's what we're, what we usually are. Don't get taken to court to. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> or defend it. Right. And that's yeah. where, I mean, we'll probably talk about this more tonight at the after party, because um, I have a lot of views. Of yeah. Defending the data and making sure that the process is followed and the, the um, <clears throat> Aggressive person's, you know, rights are protected. Yes. You know, throughout this whole thing, it's cool that you said that you care a lot about that. So I feel like yeah, it's cool something. Conversation because we're looking at these devices like the San Bernardino case, and like yes. you said, um, that you don't know how these forensic tools are doing this. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on with the stingrays right now, right? Where if you use the the cell site interceptor, you use the stingray mm -hmm. from Paris, and you can't talk about it, judges are throwing it out. Yep. You know, so I mean these. Companies are making a product, right? Yes. They're not releasing the source code. So, I guess through being used well, so much, it well, qualifies. Part of it. So, have you, have you know, know, like, I don't know, but like having worked with some of those, not directly on those products, I, I would caveat, but like in many cases, the devices themselves, like radios or other things, they essentially cover them under their intellectual property. There, mm -hmm. essentially, the, by disclosing that for purposes of meeting or trying to satisfy some requirement, they essentially become, you're able to directly circumvent at that point or like essentially cause the company to be unable to, you know, be financially viable for purposes of yep. developing them in the first place. Because, well, now I've released my source or my code for all of this stuff and now the bad guys have it, so they go create their own cell site interceptors yeah, and it's all those types of things that become like the aftermath of. And it's even easier with software because when we think, you know, hardware, there's going to have to, we've got to engineer something, but with these software exploits, and we look at things like Zerodium, where we can say, okay, I want remote code execute, or I want a physical lock bypass on Android 8, and Zerodium's going to say, I'm going to cut you this huge check. What would stop somebody if these companies would have to disclose that from saying, proof of concept, Zerodium, pay me my Bitcoin? And it's, a, I mean, think of it, because you're probably more in it than I am to know that that market's huge. The exploit market, the Vaughn discovery and exploit development market's huge. And one of the big things that, because uh, I spent a couple weeks here going around and teaching mobile forensics. 
And that's always one of the things that I have to hit and I hit hard. Like, this isn't, the way that we see it through the marketing material is not what it is. You know, by the time we see it, it's just bypass this, this is supported. But in reality, this is a highly competitive market that is, you know, specifically offensive security. And it's completely glossed over as being a couple clicks of a button. And then we have these things that are pivotal pieces of evidence. And like you said, one, we've got, you're innocent until proven guilty in this country. And we've got to protect everybody's rights, period. And the weight that should be taken, in the state of West Virginia, where I'm from, you know, one of the th burdens on the prosecution is we must know every facet of evidence. So good, bad, ugly, and different. And that is a very high standard when you get 20 terabytes in a case. And you're expected to know what is incriminating, what's exculpatory, what's the validity of it. And you have to go through and explain it. And I can tell you it's changed my thoughts and opinions and a lot of the actions of myself and the folks that I get a counsel with on the way that we handle the offensive nature of passcode bypass or privilege escalation of mobile devices. Because I'm going to tell you, if you go to any agency and say, do any of you guys hack mobile phones? No. Okay. How many passcodes you bypassed this year? <laughs> 300. All right. <laughs> we, uh, other folks might disagree with what you do. But, I mean, it is what it is. So, yeah, definitely looking forward to furthering the conversation on how we, um, you know, how it moves from that. <sighs> I think that's all I got for this. Thank you all.